Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, AJ Hogue, where AJ's more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's AJ with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. I'm AJ Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native, and the father of the Effortless English system that trains you, teaches you. You speak English fluently, you speak English confidently, you speak English powerfully, you think in English, you speak English effortlessly when you commit to my VIP program. You commit and you don't quit. You join, you commit to my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Go to that website EffortlessEnglishClub.com, EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Now, of course, you know, my business course is coming back soon, very soon, very, very, very soon. Uh, we're getting the last few details, getting it onto our courses site. We'll have the sales page ready soon. So very, 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 very soon, we shall have the... Business English Conversations course. Coming back, a really powerful course, a business training course. will help your jobs, will help your career, will help you with job interviews, resumes, and getting better jobs, doing better at your job, getting promotions, all of those things. Plus, of course, business English and lots and lots of idioms. That business English course, it's actually two people teaching the course, myself and my father. I did the course with my father. It's Father's Day coming up, so it seems like a good time to launch the course again. In fact, what I'll try to do when the course is ready for selling, I'll ask my dad to do, uh, maybe we can do a few interviews. I can interview my dad a few times here on the show and talk about business and business English and about the course. So that'd be fun. I'm sure my dad, he'd be happy to, to uh, do an interview with me, uh, maybe a few interviews. All right, today we're doing Brave New World Chapter 2, our book club, Brave New World Chapter 2. I'm live on Facebook. I'm a little early. The reason I'm early is the babies are sleeping now. It's a good time to start. Uh, a couple hours from now, my usual time, uh, I know they'll be awake. One of them is going to be hungry, maybe both of them hungry, crying, going crazy. So it's not a good time to do the show. So apologies to anyone if I'm surprising you and doing this early. Uh, though we have a lot of great people who join us live. So I'm sorry I'm doing this one a little earlier than normal, but at least we can do it live. That's the good news because sometimes the babies don't let me. All right, I'm just going to say a quick hello to everybody who's joining live. Then we will start Brave New World Chapter 2. Good to see Dodd again. Dan, welcome. Cardo, good. Doing well. Thank you. Um, Italiano, that's nice. Ronan, good to see you. Alexi, as usual, great. Taha, also. Suradet, nice. Tomas, good to see you. And Evangia, Max, etc. Ramesh, Mina Sevak, good to see you as well. Let's just get into Brave New World Chapter 2. Brave New World Chapter Number to. All right, so remember chapter one, there was a uh, tour, right? There was the tour of the, um, the, the place where they made the babies. So the tour continues now. Remember the director is showing some students this uh, area, this place. The tour continues and... Um, Next, they go to see where the children are. So chapter one, we saw babies, right? Or even before babies, before they're born. Now we're going to like after they're born. The next room, the next area is after the babies are born. So they go into this next room, the infant area. Infant, an infant is a, basically a baby. An infant is a baby. So they go in and again, first they notice there are, you know, lots and lots and lots of babies that look exactly the same. Remember, they make these not just twins, but they make like 90 babies all exactly the same, like a factory. 
and they have them dressed in uh, different colors. It depends on their caste. Caste, C-A-S-T-E, caste, is like their social rank, right? Their social rank, their class, social class. And they use Greek letters to describe it. But basically, there's like, I think they're five. I can't remember. But anyway, they use Greek letters. So alpha, the alphas are the top. They're the ones that are the top, the rulers. And then they have the betas and the deltas and the, what is it? The gammas and the epsilons, I think. Right? And so they, even, even when they're babies, they already decide what class they will be in. And they dress them in the same color. The same class is the same color. Now, next, we get a very um, kind of sad demonstration of how they program the little babies. Again, they program them. They're just little tiny babies, so they're helpless. This is what they want. You know, this is what our rulers now want, to program us when we're helpless, little babies. That's the best time they can program. That's why they want uh, school earlier and earlier and earlier. First, you know, it was just first grade. Then they... Then they gave us kindergarten. Then it's preschool. Now it's early preschool. They want your children as early as possible. Then they can program them. And they're helpless against the programming. So we get a little example. They put some nice pretty flowers, some roses on the floor. And they put some books on the floor. Books and roses. Very colorful and beautiful. Next, they bring in some babies. They bring babies into the room and put them on the, on the floor. The babies see the roses in the books. They're curious, so the babies crawl. They're very excited. They run, not run, but they crawl over to the roses in the books. They start grabbing them and touching them. And then suddenly, they make a violent, loud explosion. Boom! Really, really loud, and they scare the babies. And the babies start crying. Ah! Next, the floor is electric, so they shock the babies with electricity. They shock them with electricity, so pain. So electricity, loud noises, and the babies are terrified. They scream and scream and scream. Then they turn off the electricity, and then they, they, the babies start to calm down finally after a while, and then they try to make the babies, you know, look at the roses or look at the books. And the babies uh, are afraid of the books and afraid of the roses. They, they move away from the roses. They move away from the books. Because why? This is, this is really basic conditioning, very basic psychological programming. They connecting pain and fear to the roses in the books. You just put these two things together. You put a strong emotion and something else together. It's called anchoring and you're in NLP. And you create the connection. So in the baby's brains, they connect books and roses to pain and fear. And then the director says, we will do this many, many times, hundreds of times. So then the babies will grow up and they will hate books and they will hate nature. And they won't even realize it. They'll think it's just an instinct. They, they won't even remember any of this. They'll think it's just some natural instinct they have to hate books and to hate nature. They'll think it's genetic, maybe. But it's not. They're programming them at a very early age. They'll have a hatred of books and flowers. So then one of these students ask, well, why? Why, why should they hate nature? We, and the student says, I understand. We don't want them to like books because they are in the low class. They're low class, so we don't want them reading books. They might get bad ideas from the books. They might learn independently from the books. We don't want them to do that. So uh, we understand that. But why nature? And... Uh, the director says, because we need the economy. We need them to buy things. We need them to buy and buy and buy things. And nature is free. If they like nature, they can go to the countryside and just walk around. They can just enjoy trees and flowers. They won't spend money for enjoyment. That's not good. That's not good. We want them to hate nature. So then they will 
buy things to feel good. They will buy things to relax. So they decided to get rid of the love of nature. Next, they talk about, the students ask another question. He's telling a story, and the director talk, says, you know, now there are no parents. They're talking about the past. They said there used to be these things called parents. There used to be mothers and fathers, but not anymore. Now the state, the government, the powerful, they raise all the children. There are no parents. There are no mothers. There are no fathers. They definitely want this. They are trying to destroy the family. Everywhere around the world now, these globalist banking families and the politicians, they're, you know, they're all trying to destroy our families. And they're trying to get our children younger and younger and younger. Uh, they, mention Ma they mention Henry Ford is kind of like their Messiah, their prophet, their holy person, Henry Ford. Who's Henry Ford? Remember, he made the Ford Motor Company. He is the, one of the fathers of the Industrial Revolution, right? One of the fathers of the Industrial Revolution, Henry Ford. The factory, the factory system of mass production. So now he is like Jesus for them in the future. He's like Jesus or Muhammad or Buddha. They don't have religion anymore. Instead, they, they don't worship Henry Ford, but he's like their, their great guru, oh, Henry Ford, because now they're trying to use the same techniques, the factory techniques for people. You can see how evil this is, right? <laughs> Next, they go to another room where they use sleep programming, where the, when the uh, babies are sleeping, they play these, uh, you know, in their ears, they play messages. And they tell them, they play messages, in this example, they're playing messages about social class. And they, they're teaching the babies to dislike the other social classes. So if someone's a beta, right, the second class, they play them messages in the sleep when they're babies and very young to say, you know, oh, the other classes under you, they are, they're stupid. You don't want to play with them. You want to avoid them. They're not good. And the ones above you, they're better. They're very great. They're wonderful. But the ones above you, they must work very hard. They work harder than you. You're lucky to be a beta. You're lucky to be a beta. You have an easy life. So they're programming them to be in their social position and to be separate from all the others, right? This is something, of course, this is a basic political technique used uh, around the world. For This is an old technique of make the social classes hate each other, make the poor hate the middle class and make them fight against each other, make the somewhat rich and the middle class fight and hate each other while the super rich are on top of everyone. So everyone underneath, they're constantly fighting against each other. Meanwhile, the super rich, the super powerful, the world controllers, they just continue to get more money, to get richer, to have more power, and everyone below them is just fighting each other all the time. They never fight the world controllers. And that's it. That is the end. So uh, see a few notes I wanted to talk about. Number one, this conditioning. This conditioning to hate books is a good example. Why hate books? Why is that important for people to hate books? It's important for people to hate books because books are the number one way to learn independently, to really get red-pilled, to really find truth, to really teach yourself for homeschooling, Reading books, especially those old great books, that is the number one way of mental freedom to find the truth. So they hate books. And now we see this now. This is one of the reasons, by the way, you know, I mentioned evil Disney. They're evil for many reasons. But one, one way that Disney, like Disney kids, Dis the little small cartoons like the Disney Channel, they're designed to make kids hate books. Why do you say that? How, how does that work? That might not seem obvious. 
See, what they're doing with those shows, one thing they're doing, they're doing many things, but one thing they do with those shows is they destroy your child's attention. They're destroying your child's ability to concentrate on one thing. How do they do that? You'll notice in those cartoons, those, the new ones, I'm not talking about the old Disney movies. I'm talking about their, their right now Disney kids, the ones for like little small children, like two-year-olds, three, five-year-olds on their TV show and older. You'll notice that it's just constant, super bright colors, super bright colors, constantly changing. It's constant, constant, constant different noises and songs, almost random, almost random. There's almost no story. Watch one of those. Um, I was at my sister's house and my uh, nieces and nephews were watching one of those Disney shows. And the, the, the stories are complete nonsense. There's no meaning to the stories at all. It's just constant changes. The, the scene cuts and changes all the time. Weird little characters kind of constantly coming and going. So, suddenly some weird song comes and then another song. And then just all these strange objects and lots and lots of bright colors all the time. Why? Because it'll get your, gets their attention and it, all, it distracts them. And what happens is that your child becomes used to this, that they constantly huge bright colors and all these changes all the time, all the time, all the time. And eventually it becomes harder, it's more difficult for the child to concentrate on just one plain thing, like a book, like a white book with black letters. That becomes boring to the child, just a white book with black letters. And you have to focus on it for 30 minutes or an hour or two hours, just reading and reading and reading and reading, focusing on this one thing, concentration. This becomes hard for a lot of children now because they're constantly playing on their little cell phones, playing on the iPads, watching these cartoons that are constantly changing in colors and sounds and, and they can't focus. And when they can't focus, they learn not to like books. They learn to think that books are boring. This is one of their great chances to free themselves mentally as a child or as an adult is reading. And so they are designing it so that they think that reading is boring. Same with school. Why do you think school is so boring? One reason school is so boring. They want them to to not like learning. They want them and you, all of us, to think, oh, learning is boring. Studying is boring. Researching is boring. Or stressful. So when you finally become an adult, you're just, oh, I'm finally, I'm finished school. Oh, I don't want to read any serious books again. I don't want to study again. I don't want to research again. No, I'll just mindlessly go to my job now and listen to the television. That's what they want. So that's why school is not amazing. They don't want school to be amazing. They don't want people to graduate and become powerful, independent learners. They don't want you to research information yourself. They want you to just watch TV and accept the lies. So this conditioning is happening. Not the same way as the book. You know, we still have parents now, although families are being completely destroyed. Look at the divorce rate everywhere around the world. They are destroying our families very well. They are making school earlier and earlier, younger and younger and younger. They are programming children with these apps and iPads and television shows to destroy their concentration and also send them little messages. There are lots of little bad messages in those shows too. You have to watch them carefully and you'll start to see the kinds of messages they're sending in those children's shows and those children's movies. They're not good. They're not good. They teach them to be bratty, number one. One of the key things you'll see is they will that the child characters are usually very bratty and they're kind of rude a little bit to adults. They're sarcastic. They're training the kids not to respect adults, not to respect their parents. So lots of bad stuff, guys. Lots of bad stuff. 
What else? Um, I think those are the main messages, really, that I got from it. We can go to the uh, the comments and questions in a second because I'm sure we'll have a nice discussion as you all uh, give your ideas about this. But again, we're continuing with the idea of early, very early um, programming. And then, of course, then the other one, the other main point in this chapter is about social class, social class. And this has been used, again, this has been used for hundreds of years to control people. The super rich, the super powerful, the, those at the very top, the, the world controllers have used this for a long time. It's called divide and conquer, divide and conquer, divide the people. We don't want the working class, like factory type workers and the middle class and the like professional class, maybe like lower upper class. We don't want all of them to join up together because then they might join together and fight the world controllers and create a better world. They don't want that. They want those three groups and the super poor, the four, they want them all divided. They want the poor to hate the working class. They want the working class to hate the middle class. They want the middle class to hate the upper, the lower upper class. They want them all to hate each other, not to connect with each other, not to be friends with each other. So that the ones at the very top are safe. So that none of those groups focus on the very top. None of those groups join together and start to help each other and learn from each other. So class warfare is a very old thing. I mean, Marx, this is one of the evils of communism. Communism is all about this. All about this. And this, this fake lie of, oh, yes, all the poor will rise up and we'll have a, a utopia, a perfect, uh, you know, where, where the, 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 the jealous poor can kill all the people in the middle class and kill all the people in the professional classes. And oh, and then it'll be wonderful. But it's not, of course, because there's still the world controllers on top, the Communist Party officials at the top. They're still the elite. They're still controlling everything. They just destroy the middle class and the upper middle class. So then it's just a bunch of peasants and workers. And then, again, those at the very top. The ones at the top, the world controllers, they always stay at the top. Communism is an evil, evil, satanic lie. All right, let's go to comments and questions. Rameshmina Sivak with a summary here. Huxley used reproductive technology to produce hundreds of living organisms. They were treated by unnatural ways. Gave them a type of intelligence that wants to give them and produce children of different categories. This is just like factories, right? They're treating the children, they're treating humans like a factory, like a product, right? So you have like one model of a car. And then you have another model of a car and you make hundreds and thousands of them. And that's what they're doing. They have different categories, like the most intelligent to totally moronic. And it's their choice. The world controllers decide not be children. It's not The children can never reach their total potential. The authoritarians remain on top and can rule them all. Yep. Oh, bratty. I mentioned the word bratty. Bratty means like spoiled and uh, rude behavior from a child. Bratty. It's a nice word for a child, for a bad child. Bratty. Okay, Mustafa Arman says, uh, I'm Arman from Bangladesh. In my opinion, you're revealing secrets of evils. I love your works. Keep shining, dear brother. Lots of love for you. Thank you. That's why we're uh, studying this. This is a handbook of evil, is what it is. <laughs> Winton is a little bit uh, naive. Uh, it would be really miserable and unsolvable if those at the top utilize such power to control us. I don't see. I don't actually comprehend yet if they want to control us that deeply. They do, and they already are. They already are not quite in the same exact techniques of this book, but using media, 
schools, government, they are already doing it. Absolutely, they want they want total control. Why do you think YouTube is now banning and deleting so many accounts and Facebook and Twitter? They want to silence everyone who disagrees. They want total 100% control from your birth to your death. That is their goal. They don't have 100% control yet, but they have a lot. They have a lot, and they are trying to do more and more. It's never-ending. So don't be naive about it. They absolutely want that. Just look at the evidence. Just do some research. Michelle says, it's a book written um, against the supremacy of science and progress to the detriment of humans. Yeah, that's also exactly right. It's a book written on the golden age of Taylorism, of Ford. Uh, that's exactly right. It's the evils of technology. It's showing the evils of technology and so-called progress that are really anti-human, that have become anti-human. I think we can all see this, that technology for the most part, is now becoming anti-human, leading us away from happiness, leading us away from virtue. I mean, really, cell phones is nice, but overall, I'd say cell phones are negative, not positive. I think when I look around at most people, cell phones are harming people quite a lot. Social media, I would say is the same. There are some nice things about the internet. What we're doing now is quite nice, but there are a whole lot of bad things. And it's not just that. It's just that the technologies of media have been used to brainwash people. The psychological systems, all these things. Yes, this is a warning. Hey, cool. Michelle, Paulika, AJ, I want to say I've been listening to you for over a year now super motivated. I'm fasting now from food and alcohol. Hey, awesome, man. I'm fasting too. Because of that, I'm staying in super, super, super high motivation. I love you, man. You really rock. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And hey, congratulations. That's great. I am today. I'm doing my first dry fast, 24 hour dry fast. That means no water, no food, nothing, nothing. Another brick in the... Sirkan, exactly right. Nice. Yes, Sirkan says, another brick in the wall. The album, and especially that song part, I can't remember which one it is, but it's, you know, we don't need no education. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Good video for that, too. Yes, so Dalal with a nice uh, comment here. Good point. They want our kids to be slaves to them, actually. One thing happened to me yesterday. I discovered the games on my daughter's iPads show many pop-up ads. It's pornography leading kids to corrupt the kid's mind. Exactly. Throw that shit away. They don't need a fucking iPad. They don't need an iPhone. They don't need the internet. They don't need it. Buy real books. You know, where's the book? Buy paper books or go to the library. You don't have to buy them. Go to the library and r just borrow them. Okay? The, I'll just tell you right now, with my own children, I have a rule. No screens. No screens. So no computers, no phones, no iPads, no television. Now, they're babies now, of course, so it's an easy rule. But as they grow up, this will be the rule for them. No screens at all. They don't need the internet, okay? Look, the internet was born when I was uh, in college. I didn't start using the internet until I was, uh, I don't know, late 20s or 30s, something like that. It's, it, I had no problem learning how to do it. It's super easy. So when they become adults, they can handle it better. I'll teach them about it. I'll teach them the, the good points and the bad points. I'll teach them the dangers about it. And then they can learn about it maybe when they're teenagers little by little. But when they're young, no screens, zero screens, none of that garbage. 
It's all programming. And there's a lot of bad stuff like this pornography stuff. Evil. But even without pornography, pornography is obviously, that would be the worst. But even without that, there's nothing good comes from it. It's not educational. It's a lie. Disney and all their garbage, they, they try to pretend it's educational. So they'll have some stupid little lesson inside their show like, you know, one plus one equals two, Goofy. <laughs> now a bunch of stupid stuff that makes no sense at all. It's not educational. Your kid's not learning anything from that stuff. Forget it. Books. Books. No screens. No screens for kids. None. 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 Cecil says, I think we should not blame technology, but what we do with it. You have to be accountable. This is true. For sure, this is absolutely true. But um, I think we do have to blame technology in a way because um, we're not ready for it. And I'm saying like we, not like you and I, but as a people, as a culture, we clearly are not ready for it. It's too much power. It gives too much power to the controllers at the top and regular people just cannot deal with it. They're powerless against it because it happens too young. And so the technology is really tainted with evil. Can we use it for good? Yes, but we don't. And I think it's too much power. It's sort of like, you know, some, you know, having a super bomb, like the atomic bomb. I think we'd be better if we didn't have the atomic bomb. So you're right. We have to individually, this is our only choice because the technology does exist. It's not going away right now. So we have to be accountable and we have to have more discipline. That's our solution individually. But as a society, I think it's harmful. BB says, can you give examples of bad messages in TV shows? Well, I just gave a few, actually. Yeah, Evan, uh, Evgenia says, I don't think about this before. It's really true. It scares me a bit. What will be next? Only God knows. I think... How should I raise my children and protect them from this horrible system? How do you protect your children? Number one, homeschool, 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 homeschool your children. Number two, when you homeschool or just in general, books, 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 not screens, and especially old books, old books. Like find children's stories from 100 years ago. They're still great. Those traditionally uh, stories, not the modern children's books. Blech. That garbage is going to have messages. And so you're going to have to read them yourself every time or else you, you don't know what your child's reading. But get them the old books, the old traditional books of your culture and even of other cultures. So, so I mean, there's so many, right? We have, there's so, so many. Um, actually, I just got good news. Vox Day's, um, Vox Day's publishing company they're planning to um, republish, to republish a series of children's books called Collier Classics. Collier Classics. And this is, I mean, there's a lot of, these are big books. It's like an encyclopedia almost of filled with stories for children, but old traditional stories with good messages. And he's just planning, they're going to, they're going to bring them back and publish them from his company. So that, like I bought those already. I bought, I went on eBay and I bought the old ones. Like I bought, they're like from 1911. <laughs> so I already have that series of books, um, a really old copy of them, but it's cool. They're going to make new copies with the same original material. So that your children could learn, you could homeschool with those stories. I mean, because it's, it's, it's a huge collection, like 10 books and they're large books. So you could, for years and years and years and years and years, your children could learn from those books. And you could help them learn English, too. And they're not like baby books. They're, good, they're a nice level uh, of, you know, intellectually. And you can, of course, find other classic books. So this is how you do it. And number two, so that's what you do on the positive side. And number two, for defense, no screens, no screens, no screens. That means no video games, too, by the way. No video games, no TV, no movies, no iPads, no apps, no phones. If, you, if, you're, if you're terrified, your kid needs a cell phone because they have to call you in an emergency, even though we had thousands of years without that, 
If for some reason you need that, get a flip phone, a stupid phone, right? Not a smartphone, just a flip phone that can only call or text, no apps. That's my advice. Of course, do what you want. You know, you're, do whatever you want, but that's my advice. Yeah, and Alexei, with another important point, the difference between movies and books. When you watch the movie, your imagination isn't working. Yeah, you're kind of in a, it's almost like hypnosis, like hypnotic. Your mind kind of goes into this state. It's easy to influence. You're kind of like, you know, like a trance. Unlike reading books, right? When you're, when you're reading a book, it's much more active. It's more active. You have to use your imagination to imagine what the book is describing. So your mind is more active and engaged, less like a trance. The elite will be using this in terms of putting propaganda in lots of movies. Oh, they do. And cartoons. How to struggle with it. In my opinion, we have to uh, put a seed in our children's mind that books are the source of information and entertainment by using your imagination. And the movies are a way to nowhere. Well, well, well said. That's right. You must train your children to love, love, love books and to see through the TV and movies. So I don't, at a young age, you just, they must totally avoid screens. When they get older, maybe middle school, maybe high school, early high school, middle school age, so 13, something like that. Then I would start to teach them propaganda techniques. I would read Brave New World with them. Your language or English, doesn't matter. I'd read uh, Animal Farm with them. And then I would watch some TV shows with them, but analyze them. Say, okay, watch this. Watch how they use the camera. Watch, listen to the music. See how they're changing your emotion using the music. Look at the messages. Look how the, the father in the advertisements is always stupid and the woman is always like smart and rude to him. What is, why are they sending that message? What messages? And ask him questions. What messages are they trying to send? What do you think? So train them. Train them. Teach them the habit of analyzing TV, of turning their brain on again when they watch a movie. Turn their brain on again when they watch a TV show so that they see through it. They see the techniques being used. They understand the propaganda and how it's working. They understand and they see the messages that are not obvious. In this way, so your child will not be helpless. When they become an adult, they're not helpless because they've never seen a movie, right? That's not good. No, they've learned for several years the propaganda technique. So now, anytime they see an ad, anytime they see a movie or a TV show, they see it all. They see it all. But you have to wait till they're old enough. A young child can't do that. Uh, a young child, you should just protect, teach them that, you know, movies and TV are stupid and distracting and not good and teach them to love books. Read to them. Read to them every day, every night. Read, read, read to them. Read them amazing stories and act them out and help them use their imaginations and talk about the books with them. Discuss the books. Discuss the stories. Discuss the characters. Make the books come alive so they learn to love, love, love books and reading. Alexi is 100% right. Very well said. As usual, Alexi. Din says, uh, if I have a chance to go to Japan, can I meet you there? Yes, if you visit Osaka. <laughs> Anyone who visits Osaka, send me a message on Gab or Twitter, and we can, uh, we can arrange a time to meet. I'm happy to meet you. Sir Khan, Pink Floyd, yes. Uh, Claudio asking about a specific show, and I haven't seen it. AJ, you're our Morpheus. Yes, I'm trying to be Morpheus. Good point. You guys are Neo. I'm Morpheus. I have a question for you about this type of com uh, conversation. I watched the Netflix series Black Mirror. I think they're red-pilled. What do you think? I haven't seen it. I don't have a Netflix, Netflix account anymore, so I haven't seen that one. But there are a few out there. I mean, the movie The Matrix itself certainly is sending us that message. So um, I don't know about Black Mirror. If Maybe others have seen it can tell me their opinion.
Yeah, Elena with a nice point. It's obvious all technical innovations are designed to make people weak. I don't know about all, but most, right? Many. People can't act without their devices anymore. They're so weak without all this stuff. Yes, that's right. And sometimes it's a choice. Sometimes these things are designed to make us weak. And sometimes it's an accident. Sometimes, you know, people make things just to make life easier and have a good intention. You know, I just want more convenience or something. That's okay. But the problem is we become dependent, like Ileda is saying. We become dependent and then we become wimps. We become weak and, oh, now I have to have this thing, right? Now I have, like in America, cars, right? American cars are convenient. They're nice. But the problem is Americans have become so lazy in most places that now they depend on the cars to completely. They never walk anywhere. They don't walk. They don't ride bikes. And they become lazier and lazier and weaker and weaker. Just one example. That's right. Good point. And so this is the danger of these things, that they can make us weaker. And this is a reason why, I think a good reason why, to uh, take a break from these things as much as you can and to have a simple life and not depend on these things. Most of these things we don't need. We don't need them. They're nice. They're luxuries. They're Maybe sometimes they're nice. But we should not depend on them too much. It makes us weaker. Yes, that's right. This is one, one reason I like this fasting and exercising and all these things. It, these things make us stronger. They do the opposite. Yeah, Taha, another example, says, Taha says, each time I see my niece or nephew, they're holding phones. I think my nephew and niece are facing an imminent peril, meaning imminent means uh, coming soon. Peril is danger. That I should ban them out of this approach they're using in schools or kindergartens. I, not only I, plus all the audience here, must ban our children from using phones and being brainwashed. That's my advice, you know. You're the boss, of course, of your life. But that's my best advice, is to ban it. That's what I am going to do with my own children. 100%. Very strong. I think this book is useful for parents. Thanks, AJ, for waking us up. Yes, and you know, it's sad enough. It's already sad, right? If you go out in a city, like I live in a city, a big city. So I see on the subway or just walking, just walking outdoors. I look around and so many people with their phone, uh, like a zombie staring at the phone, and they're not aware of around what's around them. They're not appreciating what's around them. And they don't talk to people anymore. They don't connect with each other because they're too distracted by the phone. Well, that's already bad with an adult, but what a tragedy with children. I see this sometimes. I saw it, what, it was last week. I was walking in a um, park, and I look over and I see this little group of children, small, like seven years old, and one of them has a phone, and all the rest are circled around this girl with the phone, and they're all just looking at the phone, and she's pressing buttons, pressing buttons, and they're all just standing there, for a long time, just staring at this phone, not playing games together, not running, not climbing, not jumping, not getting dirty, not interacting in any way, not looking at each other, not talking to each other. All of them like little program zombies staring at this cell phone. They're outdoors in the playground staring at a damn phone. That's evil, man. That's evil. That is tragedy. Of course, it's not my children, so I'm not going to do anything, but um, it's not good. It's not good at all. That is Brave New World. They are being programmed at that little age. So sad. I, you know, this, it makes, it's sad and it also makes me angry. You may can tell by my language because uh, it makes me angry. When, they, when I see it with adults, I kind of think it's pitiful. When I see it with children, it makes me angry because it's what they're doing. Yeah, so like uh, GM uh, Himali says, if someone's interested or used to reading often, they can learn a lot by themselves. This has been my secret in life to learning things, by the way. I'll talk about it in a minute. Nowadays, 
younger generation doesn't have the habit because of modern technology. Yeah, they're so distracted by their phones, you don't see them with books, do you? If you read a book, you can visualize your own pictures over the characters and environment. You'll naturally become creative and sensitive. This is what I myself experienced. Well, well said, and I agree. And the other thing is that books are deeper. I mean, you can put a lot deeper information in a book. You can put more details in a book. You can put more deeper philosophy in a book than in a, a video. Uh, you know, this is how people often ask me, AG, who was your guru, right? Who was your business teacher? People ask me that. How did you learn business? How did you learn business and build your business and become financially free? Who taught you that? Who was your teacher? Books. No one taught me that. Books taught me that because I read a lot. So I read and read and read and read and read books, business books, marketing books, uh, books about financial freedom, constantly reading and rereading those books. And then, of course, trying the ideas in real life and then reading again and then real life, reading again, real life. I taught myself or we could say those writers taught me. They were my teachers, the writers of those books. They were my gurus. They were my teachers. Same with English teaching. How did I learn these different things? Books, reading books of other interesting teachers, reading about their methods, reading about their techniques, then trying these things in, my, in the classroom, and then maybe changing them and improving them, then reading more books. You can teach yourself almost anything now with books, and some, some videos are useful for some skills. Like if you want to learn guitar, there are some great videos out there for learning guitar or any musical instrument. And there are some nice audio programs too. Those are also nice, but books especially, especially for those uh, kind of deeper intellectual topics, books, books, books. A love of books is, will be one of the greatest gifts you can give your children. Just teach them to love books. Then they have the key to independent learning for their whole life. All right. Tata. Talking about the old Soviet Union. They had kids in the same class, factory workers, poor factory workers, and rich engineers together in a class. My granny and even mom were participants in this. I wonder where's the trick? It seems positive at first sight. Yeah, exactly. Kind of no dividing between rich and poor. But, Tata, what about the communist, what about the, the top leaders of the Communist Party in the Soviet time? Hmm? Was Stalin sending his children to that same school? I don't know if he had children. But, you know, Brezhnev and et cetera, right? And the very top uh, officials of the Communist Party. They're the world controllers. They're the world controllers. So the communist trick is to create a really huge group at the bottom and then still the world controllers at the top. The Brave New World way, the capitalist way, it's not really capitalism, but we'll call it that. Um, the Western way is the globalist way is to still have the same group at the very top, but then at the bottom have lots of people divided. Lots of different groups, three, two, three different groups, but they both have the same result. You still have Napoleon and the pigs at the top. So that's the hidden trick you're asking about. Look, we're all equal, but some are more equal than others. Remember the quote from Animal Farm. Look, we're all equal. Oh, except for the top KGB officials. Oh, except for the top Communist Party officials who are riding around in limousines and eating, you know, the, the best food and have the best of everything and have all the power over everyone else. They're not equal. <laughs> right? That's the communist trick. Yeah, like To Turan Tree says, children nowadays are addicted to the internet, especially social networking. They are. It's evil, man. It's designed to be addictive. 
One of the executives of Facebook resigned. He quit his job. He said, I can't work here anymore because this is evil, because we're harming people. We're, make, we're creating this addiction. They do it on purpose. It's a design. Okay, they, make, they study this, and they make it more and more addictive. Homeschool, homeschool, Sagban says. What if there's no project in your country? You don't need a project. Just do it. It's easy. Read books. Go to the library. Teach your children basic math. You can get on the internet and find some interesting programs like uh, Khan Academy for Math. Most people are scared of math. Usually it's the math that scares parents. I can't homeschool. I'm not good at math. Khan Academy, okay? There's, there are other ones. I just I know Khan Academy is famous, so that's a good one. There are others too. So the math, don't worry about it. Everything else is easy. You can teach them to read. Then you just read, 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 read lots of books. And if you want a structured program, you can do research on the internet. I'm going to interview some homeschoolers in the future, homeschooling moms and dads. I will interview them and ask them, you know, how do you do it? And so we'll get more detailed information. But my basic advice is don't be afraid. It's not hard. So, Zibing Yu Chirobot says, uh, which age children are ready for using smartphones? In my opinion, just my opinion, none. 18. 18. When they're adults and they can make their own choice. I will explain. Teach them about the dangers of it when they're younger than that, when they're teenagers. Um, but I'm not going to give them one. They're not going to have one. And I don't care if they complain. They can complain if they want. Sometimes you got to be a parent, and sometimes the kids are not happy with your decision, but it's still the best decision. And sometimes when they're older, when they're like 20 or something or 30, they might think, oh, you know, actually dad was right. <laughs> but in the moment, maybe they're not so happy. Tough luck. That you think? Let them complain. Nora says. Class consciousness, when the betas are criticizing the other groups for the way they look and the way they are, right? They're being programmed with that. They teach us to criticize and follow their horrible practices at a very young age. They do, they do, they do. You'll find these messages in a lot of media as well, children's shows. Sometimes we don't even realize what we're doing. The information in this book is freaking me out. I want to share it with everybody, but I know not everybody is ready for this. Share it with who you can, and some will wake up and some won't, right? Just like Morpheus said, Neo, some are not ready to wake up yet. So we help the ones we can. But yes, the criticism other, of other groups, it's, it's part of the programming at a young, young age. Yeah, like Alexi with the follow-up comment. Before I got a computer from my parents, I was such an active boy. I was playing outside the entire day. Me too. But then the evil box with the screen consumed me. The streets became empty. It was a beginning, and today I can't find any boys that will be dealing with a bicycle. Instead, they spend their time on tablets and phones and so forth. It's horrible. And now this is physically bad for them. Children need to be out running and running and running and running, like really physically active. You know, they'll say, oh, they're, they can't concentrate in school. Well, yeah, because they're sitting on their butts all day and night. So they're bored, 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 and they're, they're hyper. They've got too much energy. They're not using it. It's not good for their health. It's not good for their minds. They should be outside. No screens. No screens for children. Now, Michelle says, unfortunately, I like computer games, but maybe fasting will help me eliminate or reduce. Then I'll have more time to read books for myself and my children. You know, as an adult, again, now as adults, it's different. We have more control. So the key thing as an adult, then, is you're aware of the dangers. You have discipline and control. So, okay, you watch an occasional movie if you want. You play a video game sometimes. Just don't become an addict, right? 
It's a, it's a little different with adults. We have more control, hopefully. Oh, Harnick. Our Alex Huxley's idea is called dystopian or utopian. Dystopian. Dystopian means, uh, although, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the powerful, the rich and powerful probably think it's utopia. For them, they have total control. It's their idea of utopia. But for most of us, it's dystopia. What do these words mean? Utopia is like a perfect society. A perfect society. Everything's perfect. A dystopia is the opposite. It's a society where everything is hell. It's hell. It's like a living hell, a hellish society. I think most of us would agree that this brave new world is a hellish society of evil. It's the triumph of evil. It's the victory of evil. Merrick says, uh, hi, everyone. I haven't been here for a while. I got involved watching a TV series. After all, I found out it was a terrible waste of time. Did you have that too? I let myself get trapped. We've all done this. We've all done this. I think I have too. You watch and you watch and you watch and then you, you kind of, by, by the end, you think, well, I just wasted so much time on this nonsense story. How terrible. This happens even more now because I think the quality of TV shows has gone down. In terms of story, I mean, they've got great special effects, but in terms of story, the stories have gotten worse and worse and worse. And so, yeah, you get this disappointing feeling and you think, why am I wasting my time on this? Tomo, are you okay in there? Just Jay? All right. Mel Grosata says, AJ, you're my best teacher my whole life ever. Thank you for changing my mindset. Kisses for your babies. Oh, thank you. Rana Pon also saying hi. AJ, I'm from Thailand. Swati Krap. You're my best teacher. I listen to your podcast every day. Wonderful. Thank you. Slavika. Hey, Slavika. Screens destroyed attention and health generally. In my practice, I see lots of children and young adults are dependent on the mobiles. I strongly fight against that. Yeah, they don't need it. Why do they need that stuff? What, there's no use. There's no benefit for a child to have a cell phone. They don't freaking need a cell phone. Yeah, Din with a nice comment, which sounds like Thoreau. People think they buy a smartphone, they own it. But the opposite, the cell phone owns them. Hmm. It's kind of what Thoreau said this about all possessions. Thoreau wrote that uh, you don't own your possessions, they own you. <laughs> There's some truth in there. Sagvan says, do you think the day comes when humans reach the top of development and relax from this difficult life? I think this has to happen. I mean, why don't we could do it now. We have plenty of technology to do that now. So no, I don't think it's going to happen. I think human nature. Uh, and plus, we need struggle. We need challenge. Otherwise, life becomes meaningless and boring without that. I don't want to, you know, if, you're, if life is just easy all the time, you become weak. Hey, Tomas, nice to see you. All right, a couple more and then I got to go. I've got crying baby in the next room. Got to help my wife. Yeah, Slavika says in the movie, I haven't seen the movie yet still, Brave New World. They use lots of screens and something like a mobile, right? So they predicted this. He predicted this 100 years ago. Huxley did. He knew it. He knew it was happening. Mari, what about visual learners? They get to the point quickly with the help of 
lessons presented in video. You know, if you choose your videos carefully, but not like Disney garbage, you know, like a like a real instructional thing in, in like I said, like something like guitar, where they're showing you the position of the fingers. Yes, of course, that's very useful, right? But it's not inter it's not uh, programming. It's 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 really direct instruction. So yeah, vid video instruction certainly can have uh, benefits, of course, and audio instruction also. You just have to be careful. Audio books are great for that matter. Yeah, and Alexi again says not only children addicted to the internet. But people of all ages addicted. Yes, exactly. It's all ages. It's all ages. This programming starts early. Okay, I think I'm about finished, guys. Shafag, I'm going to read your comment and maybe one more and then we're done. Shafag Valieva. Again, I'm sorry. I try my best to pronounce your names. I'm sorry if I mispronounce them. Our childhood was much more interesting, full of love and affection. I had a great one too. We used to spend more time with our parents and relatives and friends. But nowadays life is getting worse. People don't have much face-to-face -face conversations with each other. Yes, face-to-face, -face, real life, that's where the magic is. They have been jealous and only busy with their phones, creating a fake life on social media, pretending as if they are happy. Well, Shafag, you just described the problem globally <laughs> very well. That is exactly the situation in every country I have visited, certainly every country this is happening and it is bad and it is evil and we must go against it we must fight it okay i'm gonna read marion's finally and then time to go marion with the last comment today yes everything all skills can be learned by daily practice and doing repetition we don't need to attend super high level schools because the best education, you are the boss of your own learning, comes from inside us through our life experience and book knowledge. So we need to have both to have a better life the smart way. Very, very, very well said. There's a formula, a positive formula, right? We want to end in a positive way because, again, it's a depressing chapter. <laughs> it's depressing when you realize all this. Um, but... There's also a way to go against it. And really, I think that's it. Life experience plus book learning. You combine the two. That's a super powerful formula. It's the one I've used my all my life. Anytime I want to learn something, improve in something, have some success in some area of my life, this is the combination. Book knowledge plus life experience. You must have both. Book knowledge alone is not enough. It's just in your head. Life experience alone is not enough because then you're just trying, it can be very slow learning. But when you put the two together, then you get a very super powerful learning. You, uh, you learn some interesting thing from a book, then you try it in your real life. You experiment, you see, does it work really? What happens if I try this? Then you go back and you read more and you get more ideas and then you try those in your real life again. And then back and forth between experience, books, experience, books. And of course, you can do videos. Like I'm fasting. I'm learning a lot about fasting now. And I'm mostly doing it with um, videos, the snake diet videos, Cole Robinson's videos. But they're very knowledgeable, very interesting. But then I, that's not enough. Just the knowledge is not enough. So I have to do it myself in my own life. So I'm fasting, fasting, fasting a lot. Today was my first dry fast. Almost finished. So this is how you do it. And that is, the, that is the easy, easy, easy formula for homeschooling. That is the easy, easy, easy formula for independent learning your whole life. You right now in your life. For all of us. For all of us. Okay, well, as always, a, a lot of love for you and great discussion again. Really great questions and comments. I really enjoy this book club because we get to discuss some quite deep 
ideas, some serious ideas. And, uh, you know, our live audience has been just wonderful and fantastic. Effortless English Family Live. You guys are just very thoughtful. You're really focusing on the topic. You're really thinking about it. You share some great ideas. You ask very interesting and uh, useful questions. So it ends up being a great discussion and everybody benefits. Everybody listening gets to benefit because we, we learn the book and we learn the topic much more deeply because of this discussion. So I appreciate you a lot. Thank you. And we'll be back next week with the next chapter. Until then, mwah, lots of love to you. And as always, join my VIP program. You know what to do. Commit, don't quit. Commit, don't quit to my VIP program. You speak English fluently. You speak powerfully. You speak effortlessly. When you join my VIP program, commit, don't quit at effortlessenglishclub.com. Effortlessenglishclub.com.